Welcome back, honors. All right, welcome back to us talking about one of the most boring things ever. But still, it's fine, okay? The Middle Ages just are what they are, right? However, not going to lie, again, shout out to so many of you. So happy that y'all are doing so good with understanding this concept. I think I heard Gabrielle Pavon, right, like saying in the class, like, like, it's not the most riveting stuff, but I get it, right? Like, I get that this is like a transitional phase between Rome and like the Renaissance period. So we're talking about stuff that like in the background, you've got kings and knights and like vassals and queens and moats and drawbridges and all that other goofy stuff, right? Now, what we're getting into, though, or where we left off in class, right? We were talking about a secession crisis, right? Well, what we left off in class was, of course, us accusing Molly Jernigan of being a witch and having an inquisition trial for her, where apparently we deemed it necessary to, like, burn her at the stake or whatever. So, like, now the big thing is, like, it's that red hair, man. It's that red hair. Now, the big thing, though, going into it, y'all did a great job today. Very, very impressed. And it seems that we understand what's going on when it goes to, like, what we're moving into now, which is the establishment of some of these formal areas that you now know as modern-day France, right, from the Frankish kingdoms, right? The Holy Roman Emperor, the Holy Roman Empire is that middle chunk area in the middle right there, right? We've got other areas, like, include, like, the Italian city-states coming up later on. We know that like there's like uh, like a half southern area of Spain that's got like controlled by the Muslim empires and stuff like that, which we'll talk more about them a little bit later on as well. But where we left off on is we were talking about the secession crisis that was occurring in England, right? So England would progress for 200 years after uh, Alfred the Great united the Angles and the Saxons together, creating the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of England, right? And understanding that we we're going to start growing forward. Well, at the time, it was called England. It was called, like, the Angle or Land of the Angles or Angland, right? So, but in 1066, some crazy stuff happens. One of Alfred's descendants, Edward the Confessor, the same guy who built Westminster Abbey, the same guy who like actually was considered the most pious of kings, the guy who is now even today a saint, known as Saint Edward the Confessor because of how pious he was, died with no heirs to the throne, right? Now, two people, technically three people actually, are going to claim the throne, okay? One of those guys is a Norwegian king named Harthencourt. Excuse me, hearth and court from Norway, right? So that guy is kind of irrelevant, though. So, but that's this just know in the back of your mind, like some dude from Norway apparently also claims the throne, right? And so then you've got two other guys, one of them being a man by the name of Harold Godwinson, right? Harold Godwinson, who is the son of the man named Godwin, right? Because again, Germanic tendencies. And so what's going to happen, though, is Harold Godwinson, or he's going to be the son of Godwin, and he has massive land holdings in all of southern England, right? He has a huge amount of writs, and he has a huge amount of title and land, and he is a noble of this area. And he is the one that's going to get crowned king of England, mainly due to the fact that he was the son of one of Edward's closest advisors, a man by the name of Godwin, right? Now, going forward, though, there was another man that's not even from England, and that guy is by the name of William of Normandy, right? William of Normandy, though, when he finds out that Harold Godwinson has been crowned king of England, he is furious, right? Now, just to give you a heads up, Normandy is in France. William of Normandy is from a northern region of France that you have probably heard of at one point or another if you've gone to the World War II Museum in New Orleans, right? Normandy is the same place where the D-Day invasion occurred, right? On the beaches of Normandy in northern France. So William of Normandy claims that a representative of Edward before he died said that actually Edward wanted to give the throne to him and his Normandy cousins and family, right? And so he claims that he had been promised the throne by Godwinson and Edward the Confessor before Edward even died, right? And so now we've got a war is about to break out, right? A huge war or a battle for the English throne is going to occur, and that fighting got intense. And that battle is known as the Battle of Hastings, right? Now look, going forward, there are five dates that you're going to need to know for this test. Five of them, right? You're going to need to know 476, the fall of the Roman Empire. You're going to need to know 1066, the Battle of Hastings. So every single time from now on in class, if you hear me say Battle of Hastings, just go 1066, right? You just repeat that number back to me, okay? So if I say Battle of Hastings, you go 1066. If I say 1066, Six, you go battle Hastings, okay? Like you gotta like sit up all straight and stuff like that. Just be like really early intense battle. Right? Practice one time, real fast. Ten sixty six. Battle of Hastings. Very very nice, Lily. Good job. Even though you probably skipped over that, and that's why I'm gonna count all your stuff on the fill in the blanks wrong. Now anyway, going into it though, the big thing you need to understand is that this Battle of Hastings is gonna occur as a conflict over who should control England, right? Now going into it though, Harold or like, well, there we go. 
unfortunately for Harold in this situation, is that a th total of three different people wanted to claim the throne of England, right? So in this process, he gets attacked on two sides, right? So Harold is located down here in London, right? Former city known as Londonium under the Romans, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the big thing about it is that Norwegian king by the name of Harthencourt comes in from Norway in this direction, right? He lands in this northern area of England, and Harold's army has to march from London all the way up here and fight that Norwegian claimant to the throne here. He ends up winning that battle. It's a major, major victory for Harold, but now he has to turn around and march all the way back down because northern France is down here, and William of Normandy's forces have landed in this area close to Sussex in southern England, right? So since Harold's army is now so exhausted from the first battle in the north, he ends up losing that battle to William in the south. And Harold Godwinson actually dies in that battle, right? Harold Godwinson actually got shot in the eye with an arrow through his knight's helmet and through his helm. It sneaked through and ended up hitting him in the like actual like eye. And he was strapped into his horse and he would just go and he just starts flopping around all over the top of it, right? So now the big thing that ends up happening is now that Harold has died because of this actual invasion that occurred in the north as well. Who is going to claim the throne? But William of Normandy, right? So William is now going to become king of England. But wait a second, he's French, right? So one of the biggest outcomes of this battle is the fact that on December 25th, 1066, on Christmas Day, William of Normandy would be crowned the king of England. Problem is, is that the day that he showed up, apparently, actually, after he got crowned King of England, he stepped out onto a giant balcony on the palace in London, and he, like, presented himself before the English people, and the English people actually cheered for him. They were like, yeah, William, you're awesome, and they actually cheered for him for one major reason, because they knew that William, being French, was going to centralize powers and claims under him, and he was going to take a lot of these different English lands from some of these Anglish people, right? And so since they were taking that land that means that as them being serfs maybe those contracts would be null and void and some of them would be allowed to leave right now the unfortunate thing that ended up happening before that whole process started is the day that he walked out and was like yeah look i'm king now all the people were like yeah you're king now we're so excited he spoke french they were yelling at him in english he thought they were yelling at him in a mean way, so apparently William of Normandy snapped his fingers and sent the army out into London, and they burned like a third of the city to the ground, right? Actually trying to get after people because he thought they were yelling mean things at him because he couldn't understand what they were saying. So what's going to end up happening is, write this down, French and English, the land of the Angles, a Germanic-style language, are going to mix together, and that is actually where we get modern-day English from, right? English is that is where, the reason why it doesn't follow any proper Latin-derived languages or German-derived language rules, mostly due to the fact that it's actually a mixture of both a Germanic language and a Latin language, right? So, like, actually, French, that's why we have so many cognates in French, English, Spanish, etc. For example, we talked about that today in class, right? In German, when you say God, you say got, right? So, but in French, when you say God, it's do, right? So, like, and actually, that's due to the Latin deus, right? And that's where they get their word for God from, do, as in do et bon, as in God is good. Whereas in German, it's got is gut, yeah, like, so, like, as in good, okay? So, that whole, like, sentence, got ist gut, shows you how German English is. But then if you look at other words we use, for example, like, I don't know, animal, or, like, other, like, ran, or hippopotamus, hippopotamus. Like, if you look at those different words, they're very, very French, right? So, like, looking at this entire thing, though, William of Normandy does end up actually consolidating all the land and power underneath him, and he basically creates the modern-day country of England. Now, he also becomes a new name. He actually gets started to be, blah, blah, blah. he actually gets called now William the Conqueror, right? Now, one of the biggest things that he does after, like, the blending of English and French come together, because all the English people tried to learn French to talk to him, he tried to learn English to talk to them, and so that modern-day English would be the thing that's birthed out of that. He also came up with this thing, known as the Doomsday Book, right? So when he came to power, he began to create a system of surveying everything in England, the land, everything they owned, and stuff like that. And by doing this, he could then effectively create a tax system based on the amount of items a person owned or a group of people owned, right? So it created a very efficient tax system, and it sets up England to be, this is another big thing, one more time, other little result, okay? Because we have another major impact. So our other major impacts include of William the Conqueror taking over like all of England and actually becoming the king of England. Big thing, Battle of Hastings. 
Good job, Gabrielle. Now, so the big thing, though, is actually looking at this whole thing. We've got modern-day English will be born because of this event. And the other major impact is now because the King of England is a Frenchman, you're going to see England become much more like continental Europe in culture and status rather than being Scandinavian like Sweden, Norway, and Finland. Okay, So their culture actually will like derive the most of itself from continental Europe rather than being Scandinavian. Right, So that's very, very important as well. Now moving into the next thing that we're going to be talking about in class, we're going to be discussing, not the Renaissance, but we're going to be discussing the Crusades next. Right, So if the Battle of Hastings occurred in 1066, we're then going to be moving on and talking about the Crusades in our next class. Right, So the Crusades were a series of very, very aggressive holy wars that occurred during the era of about 1099 all the way up until like the 1200s or late 1200s, right? So we're talking about wars that lasted for over like several hundred years, but they weren't continuous and there were several of them, right? It was the first crusade and the second crusade and all this other stuff. And the thing that you need to know about the crusades before I let you go is that the crusades were a series of religious wars fighting over the same exact city, right? That city being Jerusalem, right? So Jerusalem was is referred to as the Holy Land to three separate religions. Now, to Jewish people and Christian people, it is the Holy Land, the city, the main place, right? And you can actually see that in some of the ruins that are left right here, right? So looking at this, you've got places like the Dome of the Rock, which is built on top of a Jewish temple. And then you also, well, even though it's now a Muslim site, and then you also have a Muslim prayer tower right there, a minaret. But then this right here is known as the Wailing Wall. The Wailing Wall is considered one of the most holy sites for Jewish people to actually go to because it is one of the last retaining walls of this Jewish temple that was actually burned down by the Romans, right? And so looking at it, though, as you can see, there's a huge crowd down here in Jerusalem coming to visit this entire area. They actually come through go through a very special binding ceremony on their arms and then they actually like go up to the wall they say a certain set of prayers and then they also write their prayers down on a piece of paper and they slip them into the cracks of the wall because it is believed that they are at a holy site and that their prayers will be easier to get to god through that wall right now some people always ask what happens when the wailing wall fills up with like uh, prayers or whatever well they just actually like brush them off and they burn them in a holy ceremony but looking at the entire thing the thing to focus on is that this holy site is in jerusalem the wailing wall just like the dome of the rock is in jerusalem and that's for muslim people and then christians also view jerusalem as a holy city because it is in this city that christ both ascended to heaven and also was crucified right and it's also where most of his major preachings and things would go down so like this city becomes massively important to people of all faiths during the medieval era period for Western Europeans and also during the Golden Age Eastern period as well for Muslim people and also as well for the Jewish communities throughout both of those different sectors. Now the Crusades though were these series of Holy Land like wars to like take that Holy Land back and they're going to occur both in the High and Late Middle Ages. So what you're going to need to do now tomorrow, we're going to outline Islam, kind of talk about it as a religion, and then we're going to move into the Crusades, what they are, and things like that. But I'll see y'all then. Y'all have a good one. Excuse me.